From Radio Free Europe, I'm Reed Standish, and this is Talking China in Eurasia. On today's episode, we're digging into one of China's most ambitious ventures, the Belt and Road Initiative. Back when it was launched 10 years ago, Beijing dubbed it the project of the century, and it became known as Chinese leader Xi Jinping's signature foreign policy initiative, as he announced plans to revive the ancient Silk Road. During that time, it's been renamed and rebranded. Chinese companies and the Chinese state have invested nearly $1 trillion into infrastructure and new trade routes around the world, stretching from the steppes of Central Asia to the Amazon. In Beijing's official statements, this massive development push has been about shared prosperity, but it's been no stranger to scandals in the last decade. From cases of out-of-control corruption, to environmental damage, to host countries getting drowned in debt from infrastructure projects. For others, the Belt and Road has been about building Chinese influence around the world and laying the building blocks for a new world order led by Beijing. So what's really the story of the Belt and Road? And where is it going? Helping me understand that today is Jacob Mardell. He is the editorial coordinator for China at the German NGO En Ost, and formerly worked as an analyst at the Mercator Institute for China Studies in Berlin. Jacob's also traveled across Europe and Asia for years and is at the forefront of researching what the Belt and Road looks like up close. Jacob, thanks a lot for joining today. It's really great to have you on because I think there are a few people in the world that really know what Belt and Road actually is and what it looks like in practice like you do. So I'm excited to dig into this with you. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. Okay, so I think we need to start with the basics. What is Belt and Road exactly? I think most people have heard about what this is, and depending where they're from, they maybe have seen some projects up close. But where did it all begin? Why did China decide to invest hundreds of billions of dollars into infrastructure projects around the world? And what has been its impact since it launched? So in terms of what it is, I think that's an excellent question and a surprisingly hard one to answer. Um, I've been researching it for several years, and I think the best way to sum it up is that it's a marketing slogan. Um, it's a marketing slogan for China's economic activity overseas and a whole bundle of ambitions that we can talk about. Um, the origins are a little easier to pin down. Okay. Uh, it was born on September 7th, 2013, uh, when Xi Jinping announced his intention to build a, a Silk Road economic belt across Central Asia. Uh, he did this at Nazarbayev University in Astana, uh, capital of Kazakhstan. I don't know if you've visited um, Reed, but I've, I've made a Belt and Road pilgrimage in 2019 to this spot. Uh, relatively small auditorium, this dark brown varnished lectern that he stood behind. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I, I lived in Astana for, for, for many years, oh, so did? I know exactly the spot you're talking about. Oh, okay. I've only been once, but I found it a very fitting birthplace for the Belkin Road just because of what a crazy city it is with these glass skyscrapers and techno-nomadic-inspired buildings. I thought it was a, a suitable place for an ambitious initiative like this. Um, and then the whys, why all this investment? I, I think there are a huge bundle of reasons. It's about Chinese companies making money first and foremost, uh, the advancement of what we might call Global China Inc., um, these investments are intended to make commercial sense for Chinese companies, and then you have a bundle of strategic reasons, depending on the projects, energy security, in the case of pipelines, security more broadly, maybe in the case of ports, interna internationalization of Chinese currency, uh, then creating supply chains, trade routes, winning friends and influence. Um, so it's, it's really everything, and I think what all these answers have in common um, is that they describe Beijing's aspirations to play a more active and influential role in, in regional and global affairs. And then just one quick thing to note, maybe, is that a lot of this obviously precedes 2013. So Chinese companies were building roads, Chinese banks were making these big loans long before Xi Jinping made that announcement. Um, and I think naming all of this as the Belt and Road was really about putting a name to these global leadership ambitions. It's saying China is here, we've stood up, we're strong, and we have something to offer the world. Well, so, I mean, that sounds really like when we're talking, you know, big picture, this is a way for China to build influence. And as you said, especially for Xi, but for China uh, as a whole, to step out into the world and really plant that flag. But I want to break down a little bit of what you said there, because I think there's, you know, the international, then there's also the domestic dimensions to this. 
So what are what are those motivations for Belt and Road look like up close? Mm, that's a good question. I think domestically there's two policies which are very important. There's this uh, the Great Western Development Strategy of the 2000s, which was uh, really about seeking to spread more evenly the, the benefits of uh, reform and opening up to help impoverished um, internal territories like Xinjiang catch up with the rich coastal provinces. And then another policy of the 2000s, the going out or go out policy, which is about encouraging Chinese companies to expand overseas. So the BRI uh, combines these two policies. And then what you've got going on internationally, of course, around this time, or is 2008 financial crisis. Uh, China's government is responding to this domestically with a massive stimulus package. Um, and then the BRI is providing later, of course, an alternative market for China's state-owned companies beyond China's borders. And it's sold very much uh, as a stimulus package for the world. Of course, not mentioning the fact that a lot of this money is flowing to Chinese companies. Um, and then one more thing to add on the sort of political strategic dimension, I think, is that uh, we have Obama's pivot to Asia around this time, and certainly initially, and with the Silk Road economic belt, it's powered by the sense um, that China needs to open up to the West, uh, I mean, West of China directly, and mm -hmm. then lessen dependence on the West in the sense of US and its allies, while building its own sphere of economic and political influence. Okay, so that's the, the motivation from China for wanting to develop this and to sell it to the world. So what is that reception like once this gets unveiled? Um, there's a lot of enthusiasm early on, I think. Um, it did take some time to gather real momentum, uh, I think just in terms of countries hearing about it. Uh, 2018 is actually the, the peak of countries signing on to the initiative, as it were, um, in terms of countries signing uh, this uh, non-legally binding memoranda that signifies a uh, country joining the Belt and Road family. So 64 countries signed on in 2018. Um, Post-financial crisis, countries looking for uh, economic stimulus. China is rising. There's a sense of the future being in the East, this huge market, all these currency reserves, and, and people are really pinning on their hopes for a better future on China and the Belt and Road. All right, so that sounds like a very positive embrace from the world initially. Um, but I, I want to talk a little bit more about what that starts to look like as it goes out into action. Uh, China and Chinese banks, they're offering funding and cash to build all of this infrastructure that we're talking about. Um, but it's mostly Chinese companies that are securing these contracts to do so. So explain that dynamic a little bit more. What do these contracts start to look like? What kind of reputations do these companies build over the years? And how is the quality of their work received on the ground? Sure. So the archetypal Belt and Road infrastructure project, the DNA, if you like, is a, a big ticket, hard infrastructure project, like a highway or a power plant that's financed sometimes as much as 90% by a loan from usually two Chinese policy banks, China Development Bank or the Export-Import Bank of China, at varying interest rates, often with a guarantee from the host government, and then it's built by a Chinese state-owned enterprise. And the loan is given on the condition that the project is built by a Chinese company. So I think this shows you that Chinese companies are really a, a driving force of the Belt and Road. They're the most active players on the ground. Uh, BRI projects are usually things that actually emerge from host country wish lists, but if there are... Uh, Chinese entities that play a particularly large role, it is these state and enterprises in, in shaping what they look like. Um, and as you, as you asked, in terms of the difference between Chinese companies, the, the projects, their impact, there is a lot of variance. Uh, I think we do tend to have uh, this image of, of China as, as a monolith, but um, despite Chinese state being the ultimate beneficial owner of these companies, they're not all the same. Um, China's a big place with a lot of dis different decision makers, and they sometimes have more autonomy than we give them credit for. So there have been quite a few criticisms surrounding BRI projects, ranging from you know, concerns about the environmental impacts, corruption involved in these projects, and then social impacts, uh, Chinese 
Its workers, land reclamation, that kind of thing. Um, in terms of the companies executing uh, the project and, and how that affects things on the ground, um, I think the companies with more experience uh, tend to have less of these problems, probably because they've encountered them in, in the past. Um, they don't make overly optimistic project plans that then need to be altered. Um, they uh, have a better sort of awareness of regulations, especially when they're operating in, in, in Europe. Uh, they, if they've had experiences of building projects uh, under European regulations before, um, whereas companies, less experienced companies, um, run into these, these problems uh, more frequently. Um, a lot of the problems, though, with BRI projects do come down to um, things that sort of are endemic in, in host countries like corruption, uh, poor regulation. And the commonality here between a lot of uh, Chinese projects and the BRI more generally um, is the sort of amoral approach of um, China towards uh, building these infrastructure projects in countries. So lenders like the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development and other uh, financial institutions are available. They lend on certain conditions and with prescriptions on how uh, project planning, procurement um, is going to proceed. But Chinese companies and, and Chinese lenders don't really do they do those things. They, they put things in the hands of the host countries, which, which Beijing markets is a good thing. Uh, allowing countries to build what they want. But when you have bad governance or lots of corruption or few incentives to stick to environmental regulations, things tend to go south. So uh, one example keeping in Europe is this infamous Chinese highway uh, built in Montenegro that's been criticized by local NGOs for its environmental impact um, on Tarin River Basin, Basin a, a UNESCO site, and it's also mainly being criticized for really lacking any kind of commercial rationale. I mean, it's just a really, really expensive road. And you know this, of course, Reed, because I think you've traveled it. It's a short piece of highway, very, very beautiful, amazing construction, but it's got an insane price tag. Yeah, well, I remember there was there was one estimate, I think, if I recall, I don't, it was, you know, one kilometer of road ended up costing something north of $20 million or something like that is what it, it ended up factoring out to in the end. But I think this is a really good and interesting example that you bring up because that kind of leads into this term that's also been thrown around a lot with Belt and Road, which is this idea of something called debt trap diplomacy. You know, that term, it's been associated with Sri Lanka and there was a controversy there with China over control of a port in the country. And there's also been some other examples across Africa and Asia that sometimes get cited too. But Montenegro, I think, works as well, perhaps. So I'm curious, you know, can you, you tell us what is debt trap diplomacy and is that what we're witnessing or what we witnessed in Montenegro? It's an interesting one. Um, yeah, so this term, I think, was coined by uh, quite a prominent Indian critic of the Belt and Road, Brahma Chalani, in, in reference to this, this case in, in Sri Lanka. And it refers to the supposed practice of Beijing deliberately lending countries money that they can't afford to pay back, thus ensnaring them in, in a trap and leaving them uh, vulnerable to uh, China's influence, leaving them dependent on China. And I think one strand of this narrative holds that the, the end goal of ensnaring these countries is to extract assets from them. Um, the most commonly cited example being this uh, case in, in Sri Lanka of Hamden Tota Port, where uh, in sort of re return for clearing some of the debt, the um, Chinese company got a 99-year lease on uh, Hamden Tota Port. Um, I, I don't really think that's what's going on here with Montenegro. There is an ominous-looking section in the loan contract that mentions how Montenegro has to waive its sovereign rights to territory. Um, in, in terms of collateral for the loan. But if you look at the historical records on um, how China renegotiates debt, there have only been very few examples of China extracting assets or land to pay off debt. And there's been a lot of literature published now, um, including, I think, by a, a good study by Rhodium Group, which debunks this narrative. And... <clears throat> 
I just don't think it makes sense for these policy banks to make these loans with the objective of losing money. I, I don't doubt for a second that China's influence is uh, increasing China's influence is a sort of broad strategic goal behind all this activity. But um, it's not really symptomatic of Beijing's mercantilist approach, uh, it's sort of profit oriented approach to these things. And I, I think it could do a better job gaining influence if it made these loans uh, for successful projects, right? I mean, that would be a, right, that a makes more some sense, yeah. uh, effective way to gain influence. It doesn't make sense. They want to not be able to recoup their debts ultimately. Okay, so it sounds like you're saying this isn't really the most uh, you know, helpful term for actually understanding <clears throat> Belted Road in practice, and certainly not for understanding Montenegro's highway. Um, but I want to focus a little bit more on what happened in this small Bal Balkan country. You know, what is the story behind the highway and does it tell us, what does it tell us about Belt and Road in practice, how that project came about and how it was executed? Uh, it tells us a lot, I think. It's, it is a good case study. Um, so like many built BRI projects, the idea of building a highway has been knocking around for decades and it finally got off the ground after a couple of full starts. Uh, when Montene Montenegro signed a contract with this company, we've been talking quite a lot about China Road and Bridge Corporation, also a, a loan with uh, Export Import Bank of China um, for 85% of the cost. Uh, I don't know exactly how much uh, Montenegro ended up borrowing. Um, I know that because of currency fluctuations and uh, that the government didn't, ha didn't hedge against and extensions to the contract, uh, it ended up being more expensive um, than planned, but let's just call it a billion dollar highway because that's uh, expensive enough. I think you, you already mentioned how much that was per kilometer. Uh, it's, it's a lot. Um, right. And in a country of half a million people um, as well with a GDP of five, six billion. So it's really, really expensive. And it's a nice thing to have. It cuts across the mountains. You don't need to at least for this section, um, drive across uh, these dangerous mountain roads, but ultimately it's too much money for Montenegro to have paid. There'd been, uh, I think, a number of feasibility studies that painted it uh, as overly adventurous and commercially questionable. Um, also worth mentioning that this is just a 41 kilometer stretch of a, a, a much bigger planned highway from the coast of Montenegro to, to Serbia, the main tourist market, um, and as I'm sure you found out, driving it, it's very nice going across this um, stretch of highway, but you've still got to do the twisty mountain roads for the rest of the way. Uh, but the key thing is that the president at the time, um, Milos Djukanovic, really wanted a highway. I think that's what it essentially boils down to. Um, there was perhaps an element of corruption involved in terms of um, providing subcontracts. I don't know how much evidence there is for that, but it sounds likely, given uh, how sort of endemic corruption it is, um, in the area, but I really think this was ultimately a case of personal ambition. It's a dream he wanted to fulfill to build Montenegro's first big highway project, and it was a dream the um, Chinese were willing to help him um, fulfill as long as a Chinese company bought home the contract. So what I think this illustrates um, is that this death trap, death debt trap, not death trap, that's a bit extreme, <laughs> debt trap narrative is a little bit more complicated than has been portrayed. Definitely. It's, I don't think a case of Beijing acting maliciously, um, it's acting amorally. Right. So, I mean, it, it sounds like this is a far more complex situation than a term like calling something, calling it a debt trap really gets to. But regardless of that, you know, these type of scandals, whether we're talking about Sri Lanka, whether we're talking about Montenegro, these are still major hits to the image of the belted road. And they certainly haven't been the only ones over the years either. So how has China responded to cases like Montenegro that have grabbed headlines around the world like this? You know, there's been plenty. We're seeing lately things of, you know, the amount of investment through the belt and road declining. We're seeing some high profile uh, projects that were announced and touted in a really big way getting cancelled. And then we're even seeing some comments from countries wanting to leave Belt and Road now altogether. So how has Belt and Road adapted to all of that? Yeah, you're right. These cases aren't great for China's reputation. Um, 
I think because of this, and also perhaps because of a sort of longer term structural adjustment uh, taking place, uh, Chinese banks uh, aren't, or Chinese policy banks, these two Chinese policy banks aren't lending um, like they used to. Uh, even back in 2019, uh, I must say, I heard from some officials in, in host countries that it was increasingly hard to get finance for Belt and Road Initiative projects. Uh, from these these banks, so that's um, one big um, adjustment. That if you're an elite in a Belt and Road country looking to finance a dubious project like this, I don't think it's the case anymore that uh, Chinese finance is a reliable option. So uh, that's one adaptation. Uh, also, of course, there's the, all this nice fluffy rhetoric has been amped up for a start, but this emphasis that the Belt and Road is clean, open initiative has become stronger at each successive Belt and Road forum. Um, so this is the main adaptation, um, a, a reduction in, in, in lending, but I would caveat that by saying that I don't think this means the Belt and Road is, is disappearing, it's just evolving. Well, what does that evolution, I guess, look like? So... You know, where does that leave us today for the state of the Belt and Road after 10 years? You know, how has it changed? We talked a little bit on that just now. But, I mean, how integral is it to, to Chinese foreign policy uh, in this new form? Uh, I was reading the new Belt and Road white paper that came out recently. And it's got this litany of achievements of the Belt and Road, essentially. And under the infrastructure connectivity section, a lot of the projects they name um, are not projects that were financed by, uh, some of them were, of course, but a lot of them were not financed by um, Chinese policy bank loans, and some of them weren't, didn't involve Chinese finance at all. Uh, they mentioned Pelusach Bridge, for example. Uh, I'm sure you remember that one, the bridge in Croatia, built by, again, China Road and Bridge Corporation, but crucially with EU funding in an EU country. So this is uh, held up by um, this, you know, landmark paper is a landmark Belt and Road um, project. They also mention a Chinese built corridor financed by um, Asian Development Bank and, and several others. Um, so what this highlights for me is that the Belt and Road for Beijing is more about the companies than the loans. Um, the revenue Chinese companies are earning from international contracts is continuing to grow year by year. So you're still going to see the Belt and Road featuring prominently in um, rhetoric of Chinese officials and in state media, even if they're referencing projects um, that are built by Chinese companies uh, with other sources of finance. Uh, Uzbekistan, I think, is a good example maybe of how the Belt and Road <clears throat> is evolving too. I was there a couple of months ago, and there are a bunch of wind and solar projects there. Uh, Uzbekistan's sort of really quite recently, I think since 2019, um, sort of putting its foot down on the pedal with regards to green transition, building out wind and uh, solar capacity. Uh, and there have been quite a few solar and wind auctions. And uh, Chinese companies haven't won um, many or until recently of the auctions, but all of them are being built by Chinese companies with Chinese equipment. And I think it illustrates two trends that we can expect uh, to continue uh, along the Belt and Road. A, this renewable energy uh, will become more and more important and China's domination of uh, green tech supply chains will uh, be leveraged. And secondly, the financing is becoming more complex and interesting. We don't have as many loans from Chinese policy banks, but money will come from somewhere else. So I don't think it's going anywhere. Uh, but we are past um, Belt and Road, the sort of peak hype of Belt and Road. It's kind of on a low simmer, and it's going to stay there. But it's going to also have to share space with Xi Jinping's other pet projects. So we have uh, Global Security Initiative now, the Global Development Initiative, right. and the Global Civilization Initiative. These uh, Three, um, three big ones, I think. Which, um, three, three big things that might be subjects for future podcast episodes, perhaps. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> definitely worth exploring. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I, I, I want to ask, Jacob, I mean, it, it sounds, I mean, you've given this, this overview, this, this big overlay shot. 
of how things have changed and where they're standing at today. But I want to revisit this initial question that we posed in the intro of the episode, which is, what do people misunderstand about the Belt and Road? And where do you see it going? Uh, I really think the fundamental misunderstanding that I still hear policymakers making um, is taking the Belt and Road too literally um, without perhaps sufficient cynicism. At its best, it's a very loose brand. And even this isn't a brand that's controlled by an HQ and protected by copyright like you'd imagine a brand to be. You know, I've seen uh, on my travels powdered camel milk um, being sold in Kazakhstan, branded as part of the Belt and Road Initiative. So it's it's a marketing slogan at best. And I think we need to be careful about overestimating Beijing in some sense, or at least just believing this marketing um, slogan at, at face, face value. And as to where it's going, I think because it is so uh, effectively empty and so flexible um, as, as a narrative, it can go anywhere Xi Jinping wants it to go. Um, and in some sense, that's the power of it. All right, Jacob, it's been great speaking with you today. Thanks a lot for joining. Likewise. Thank you very much. All right. That's all for this episode. I'm your host, Reed Standish. Katie Toth is our producer. Studio direction was done by Kaiza Alexar. Thanks to editors Carla Padret, Kathleen Moore, and Pete Baumgartner. And to Radio Free Up journalists around the world that make podcasts like this possible. If you like this podcast, please share it and subscribe on Apple, Spotify, and be sure to check us out on YouTube. Finally, if you haven't already, subscribe to the China Eurasian newsletter, which goes out every other Wednesday. Thank you for listening, and we'll talk to you next time.